this evening. If you don't have a copy of the scripture with you, we do have some available uh, throughout the room. And I would say, uh, if if you don't have a copy of script of the scripture, uh, just just kind of look frantic for just a moment, and somebody that cares will notice that you are looking frantically, and they'll get you a copy of the scripture and even help you find Nehemiah chapter five if you need help finding in the scripture. We do believe it's important in our church for everyone to have a Bible. Now, uh, right now I cannot put the scripture on the screen, but I'm kind of averse to doing that, not because I'm just stuck, you know, in the old days or old time. I don't like some terminology that are used sometimes. You ever hear the old paths? It's like, it's a new term, old paths is, and of course it takes, I know it takes from the prophecy of the scripture and so forth, but there really aren't really old paths. I don't like the terminology of it because it kind of makes you sound like you're old fashioned or something. Reality of it is, is that I realized some time ago that God's pretty relevant, sure. right? In every generation, yes. and I've realized that as relevant as God is, actually we're pretty irrelevant. And I'm talking about culturally and so forth. In other words, a lot of times we think, uh, as far as the Scripture goes, that it is sometimes somehow fixed in or limited within a culture. You ever hear somebody say, "Well, that was back in the Bible days." You know, I wonder like what the Bible days looked like. You know, if maybe <laughs> the colors were different back then. You know, you know, you had black and white, and then you had colored, and then you had HD. You know, <laughs> Bible days. I wonder if it was like blurry and brown or sand. I always imagine it to be sandy, don't you? Like desert-like uh, back in Bible days. That's nonsense. Bible days. Uh, God was alive and real, and He has been to the same degree in every generation. Always has been. God's real. And I, I just think that we as believers ought to uh, focus on being biblically relevant instead of culturally relevant. We've really fallen down in a lot of areas. The church has heard greatly in many, many generations trying to be relevant to the culture instead of trying to be relevant to God. A hundred years from now, whatever the culture is doing will be pretty dated. But God will not be. A thousand years ago, you know, we look at the culture then from our perspective, and I think mostly because of ignorance, we think that they're pretty dated. But God was very relevant then, and God's just as relevant now. And so I just think that we just need to uh, embrace the Scripture, get to the, the Word of God. I don't want anyone to think that what's preached is just opinion, or that it is to fit within a culture, but I want them to know that the Scripture has authority, and what we believe if God says differently than what we believe, then we adjust our belief to God's authority. What, what is God's authority? The Scripture, right? This is God's authority. This is the authority for our lives. And so we can say this evening, open to the authority, Nehemiah chapter 5, and we'll begin reading in verse 14. And that's what will shape us. That's what, we, that's what we have to come under the authority of. Verse 14 of the Scripture, the Bible says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king. That is to say, 12 years, I and my brethren uh, have not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people, and had taken of them bread and wine, beside 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did not I because of the fear of God. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither bought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 of the Jews and rulers, besides those that came unto us from among the heathen, that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. And now we'll pray before we make application of the Scripture. Father, as we see a nation, as we see a people that are being led into revival and to literally getting back to what they were supposed to be and ultimately coming to the place where they were spiritually better than they'd ever been, may it be true of us this evening, Lord, that we would reflect many of the characters, many of the, the traits of these individuals who were seeking to please you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So now we've been back and forth a little bit in Ezra and Nehemiah, 
And you may have noticed, hey, Pastor, you know, we're kind of dialing back. We've already been pretty much through all of Nehemiah as we've been looking at our series on revival. There's a little bit of an explanation for that. I had planned to preach this message on a Wednesday night a couple of months ago, and I just actually wasn't able to. And I can't remember why, uh, but <laughs> there was a reason. And uh, it was actually one of the important, I believe, one of the important concepts when we looked at the cause or in effect of revival. We looked at Nehemiah's example with the way the Lord that used him in order for national Israel to come to a place of revival. I do want to review just a little bit this evening to kind of get where we are at. And I want to ask a question. Was there ever a time in Israel's history when the heart of God's people uh, was closer to what God expected or wanted from his people than in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah? It is not a trick question. Was there ever a time in Israel's history when the fervor or the heart of God's people to please God, to obey God, to live for God was at the level of as it was during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah? Okay, hold your place and let's go to Haggai again. Shall we? Let's go to Haggai. I want to apologize. I, I've got this brand new Bible. And it doesn't work right. <laughs> I don't know where I left mine. I didn't see it when I left the house today. My, I'm trying to, you know, wean myself and get into the new one. But uh, I don't know where I left my Bible. I had it Monday when I was at the school. And uh, where it is right now. It opens up automatically to Haggai. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, let's look at verse 3 of chapter 2. You see Haggai, you're at chapter 2, because if you're looking at chapter 1, you're probably looking at chapter 2 as well, right? All right, verse 3 of chapter 2. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Let's read verse 2. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes as in comparison of it as nothing? Well, I remember how we, do you anybody remember this now? Remember where we're at? Okay, so how did the rebuilt temple in Ezra, Joshua, and Zerubbabel's day compare with Solomon's temple? I see people going like, how did it compare? What did the people do who had seen who had seen Solomon's temple when they saw... Yes? They cried. They cried. The old men cried when they saw it. It was absolutely, positively pathetic. I mean, seriously. You know? Okay. So, is God being mean to the king here? Is God being mean to Zerubbabel? No. No, He isn't being mean to Zerubbabel. Why is it? Why is God not being mean? He asked the question... Uh, Zerubbabel, how does your temple compare to Solomon's? How, Zerubbabel, how is Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, I keep saying Zerubbabel, <laughs> how is Zerubbabel supposed to feel about comparing his temple with Solomon's temple? How would you feel <laughs> if you built something and it got compared with, you know, an architect's, you know, a famous architect's building? Now, some famous architects shouldn't be famous. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I'm talking about, you ever seen a structure that was impressive before? Uh, okay. Uh, what's the Sears Tower called now, Charlie? What is Willis it? Tower. What? Willis Tower. Willis Tower. What a name. How does that compare with Sears? Willis and Sears. No wonder Sears went broke. Uh, <laughs> uh, Willis Tower. Okay. So, <laughs> you build a play set for your children in your backyard, and I come over and ask you, so how does this compare with you know, this with the Willis Tower. <laughs> um, how does that make you feel? Okay, if you're taking me seriously and you really think I'm comparing your building capability, your design capability, with the designers and the builders of the Sears, it's still the Sears Tower to me. It'll always be the Sears Tower. But the, with the builders and the designers of the Sears Tower, 
it isn't really a comparison. You'd say, well, Pastor, I'm just building this for my kids to play on. I'm not trying to, you know, build a, a monument to, you know, my capabilities that will outlive and outlast me or whatever else. Um, I don't have the budget. I don't have the training. It's just not a fair comparison, is it? Under Solomon, do you think that the budget might have been better? Right? But you hate it when people come into church like this and they have no idea the sacrifices that people have made. People that don't have money have made just to have a place. And somebody will come in, I shouldn't say hate it because that's probably the wrong way of saying it. But when somebody comes and says, you know, you guys really ought to get a bigger building. You ought to get, you know, you ought to, you ought to consider, you know, getting a better location. You know, you really ought to think about, you know, the fact that you just really can't grow any bigger than that place. And you just think, well, you know, yeah, it'd be great if I lived in Kansas. You know, I could buy an acre of land for a few thousand dollars instead of five million dollars. You know, it'd be kind of nice if, you know, if I could just go out in the country like y'all do where there's no building codes or they're so minimal that anybody could, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just not fair to compare some things, is it? You don't, you know, and so Zerubbabel has asked the question, how does your temple compare with Solomon's temple? And the answer is, it just makes you feel terrible just even thinking about it. Zerubbabel is the rightful heir to the throne, but he's a puppet. The real guy is, you know, <laughs> Artaxerxes. And if Zerubbabel tried to be anything but the real guy, he'd be dead. And uh, God didn't, let, didn't tell Zerubbabel, okay, overthrow the world. Set up my kingdom. In other words, Zerubbabel was just the guy he was made to be in the hour that he was made to be. And this question is actually not being rude or cruel, even though initially asking it. It really dealt with what people were thinking. When the temple was being rebuilt, they're thinking, is God really going to live here? Is God really, I mean, is this really pleasing God? I mean, look at this in comparison with Solomon's temple. And so God just asked the question everybody was thinking. We know they were thinking it because the old men cried when they saw the foundation laid. They just, they just sobbed. They said, this is terrible. Look how pathetic we are. Go to the end of Haggai chapter, or uh, the end of Haggai 2, and verse 20. Uh, and they, again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. See, he's called a governor, not even a king, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the kingdoms of the heathen, the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet. For I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. God said, someday I'm going to destroy the wicked. I'm going to destroy the kingdom. And if we study God's word, we know that someday there's going to be a temple built. Let me ask you a question. The temple in Christ's kingdom, do you think Solomon's will compare with it? Do you think Solomon's temple will compare with the temple that's going to be built one day? Not in your life. It'll be pathetic be pathetic in comparison. And the question then is this. What is God saying? God said in that day, I'm going to make you a signet, Zerubbabel. Signet we know is a seal or a ring, a sign of approval, a stamp, a person's authority or a representation for the authority. And literally what God is saying is out of all the kings that Judah has ever had, you're going to be the one that represents that temple. That's pretty cool. I mean, he could have picked David. David wanted to build the temple, but wasn't allowed to. Could pick Solomon. I mean, Solomon's temple was... I mean, if it hadn't been destroyed today, it would be the wonder of the world. Solomon's temple would have been. It was in its day. And in, in comparison with the things that are compared to it, there's nothing to be compared. And yet, someday Zerubbabel, this pathetic governor king, with permission to be king by Artaxerxes, is going to be the representative, the signet ring, the seal, that stamp of approval that Jesus puts on his temple. So my question, will you please answer it? How did Israel in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra 
compare with Israel in every other day. What did I say? Was the question that confusing? We phrase it. Okay. How did the fervor for God in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra compare with the times before that? Terrible. There was this much fervor. Oh, wrong answer. God didn't say, I'm going to pick Solomon. I'm going to pick David. I'm going to pick literally what God said was because of the way that you've responded to the truth. To this reviving Israel, it's because of the way you've responded. Zerubbabel, you're going to be my guy that represents the heart for God. That's what Haggai's saying. Literally what God's saying is, I'm very pleased with you. My heart is thrilled with you. Zerubbabel, you represent what I say we should be. In other words, a sweat is a seal. A seal is a king's, this is mine. When a king sealed something, he put his stamp of approval on it. He said, this represents me. It's sealed. It can't be changed. And God said to Zerubbabel, hey, you're a pathetic little fella. You're a governor with permission of Artaxerxes, but in my economy, Zerubbabel, you're what I want from the heart of a person. you got the heart. He's sort of like the Rudy and what's the little, what's the movie there? <laughs> the guy with all the heart, the little, what is it? The, come on, sports people, you know the, the movie. Movies? What? Well, I mean, I know what you're talking about, but I don't. What's know. that What's that movie? It's Rudy. What? It's called Rudy, I thought. Is it called Rudy? Yeah, it's, it's like it's Rudy and Rudy. In yeah, other words, like the Rudy. little guy with a big heart. <laughs> and there's nobody on the team that has the heart of Rudy. You know? And that's the, you know, his little brother, you know? Never gives up. <laughs> he's, just the, he's the pathetic little king and God said he's not so pathetic but it's his heart because of what he's willing to do and folks that's kind of encouraging for me I don't know about you you know God doesn't all, always call us to do things that men perceive as great but you can have just a perfect heart before God and you can have revival you can be revived you can, you can have that life that God wants you to have and that is precisely what's going on in Israel in the days of Nehemiah. Now, let's go back to chapter 5. And I just want to show, we, we looked at several things that are necessary in order to have revival. And because we just don't have time this evening, I cannot review those, and I'm very sorry about that. But I want to look at what Nehemiah specifically says about the way that he governed. Okay, so we see that Nehemiah was appointed at this time to actually be the governor and he's different than the other governors. I just want to look at this. Uh, in verse 14, Moreover, from the time I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that is 12 years. And I'm so glad it's 12 years, aren't you? Common Core's got me down just a little bit. And I was, about, I was afraid that 32 minus 20 was something other than 12. But turns out, no, it's 12, even in the scripture. So, <laughs> all right. I'm sorry, I scrapped the Common Core joke I just made. Um, <laughs> Nehemiah said, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. Well, he has explained it. He said, but the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people, but so did not I because of the fear of God. I just want you to notice that a man who is seeking... Revival is a man who's not seeking something that he can make a living off of. He's not seeking to enrich himself or seeking his own benefit. And I believe, friend, that oftentimes one of the great hindrances to revival is, first of all, the matter of glory. You know, sometimes I wonder if God did a great thing if He'd get the glory for it. I know a lot of times, you know, if, if when God when when something's amazing, you know, people are pretty quick to step in and say, you know. It all just occurred to me when I was walking one night, and here's what I thought, and here's what I said, and here's what I did. Give God the glory for it. And so when I was, you know, carrying out the whole thing, and, you know, and I just thought, and I just, and they talk about themselves, and then they throw in, you know, give God the glory because He made me, and I'm amazing. That kind of, a, that kind of nonsense. The reality of it is, is that I think in many instances, if God were to do a great thing, He wouldn't be able to do it with most of us because we get in the way of Him getting the glory. I think it's rather important to realize that. I think oftentimes as well, one of the great hindrances to revival 
uh, is that people want to profit from it. This probably barely even applies. But isn't it laughable what the so-called revivalists of our day, isn't it laughable the lavish lifestyles they live? People that claim, oh, we're having great revival. I remember a couple of years ago the Brownsville thing when it was going on, and then more recently Todd Bentley's thing, and I don't know what the latest and greatest is. I've fortunately got out of the loop far enough I don't have to hear too much about it. But whenever there's a great revival, boy, it seems like there's great excesses with the quote revivalists, doesn't it? So you may wonder if Benny Hinn might be in it for... Uh, lucrative reasons. You may wonder if maybe he's not quite as genuine as he claims to be as he flies in jumbo jets. You may wonder if maybe Creflo Dollar really doesn't need a newer jumbo jet. See, what happens oftentimes, and I'm not, I, I certainly wouldn't try to confuse anybody by trying to say that what they're doing is what God is doing, but oftentimes what we're looking for in revival is just self-enrichment. I think sometimes we would like for America to be a Christian nation just so that we would be more in vogue as believers. Or as we're less grieved about sin than we are grieved that our way of life is threatened. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes I think that we're more concerned that see, the world just isn't a place where we fit very well. It just isn't very comfortable to be a Christian. We don't really like the shame of it or the being peculiar or different part of it as much. And we had rather, it would be great if we were seeing a mass turning to God so that you know we would be more normal. Nehemiah said, he said, the governors that were governors of Judah before me he said they were chargeable to the people. That is, when the walls were broken down and the, and the city was in disrepair and the gates were destroyed or burned with fire and the people were continually being plundered, one of the plunderers was the governor. He'd come by and tax the people. Even though they were barely making it, he would put a burden on them as well. And he would cause them to support him and his lavish lifestyle, to live literally in a way that they weren't able to live, and on top of that require a salary for them, and his servants could just come and take whatever they wanted from them. Literally, their governor plundered them. <laughs> Has there ever been an honest politician? Nehemiah was. I think that's kind of encouraging because it is possible, isn't it? I've met politicians. I mean, people, I, I friends who are politicians that will tell you there's no such thing as an honest politician. And I'll say, including you, and they'll say it's the name of the game. You know, it just, you know. Um, have you noticed in the politics in our country how much betrayal there is? I mean, when, when the politician runs, he always figures out what the, the people want and promises it to them. And then what happens when he does go, uh, when he's sent to Washington or wherever? He doesn't forget about it. He never meant it in the first place. He just wanted to go be part of the fraternity. And it really is the reality of it. I mean, you know, you read testimonies of people that have been there, and they're like, I just can't believe that none of these guys meant it when they promised things in their campaigns. They literally just didn't mean it at all. They didn't believe it at all. What's the guy that's uh, retiring from the Senate? Who just blessed out the president, basically bad mouthing the president? Corker. What is his name? Corker. Yeah, Corker. Bob, is it Bob Corker? Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm thinking about with the things that he's writing about, the things that he's saying? He's never been a Republican. He's never been a conservative. What he is bashing the president for are things that conservatives want. And he ran as a conservative, and he served as a conservative, and now that he's retiring, he's saying Donald Trump's an idiot because of these conservatives. Not even the things that Donald Trump's actually an idiot about but things that he ran on. He's, he's literally rebuking the platform he ran on. John McCain's doing the same thing, isn't he? You know, and on the other side, the Democrats, do they all just, you know, you just think, you said all these years this is what you believed, and now you... And you just think, man, they're all crooks. They're all dishonest. But Nehemiah wasn't. Nehemiah said, you know, all the governors before, he said they got a salary. Let me ask you a practical question. Is it okay for a governor to get paid? 
to make a living. Yes. Was Nehemiah probably exceptionally wealthy? Well, let's, let's look at what he did. Uh, this, this gets me. Okay, think about this in terms of today. Um, in verse 18, Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep, also fowls were prepared for me. One ox, six choice sheep. In today's economy, when oxen and sheep are perhaps less valuable than they were in that economy, what's the value of an ox? Does anybody know right now? When was the last time when you all went and bought a cattle fair market or a cow at fair market value? Anybody ever bought a half of half a beef? Joe, how much is a half of beef today? What's a good deal on half a beef? What? It was my parents' was one time How much was it then? Do you remember? I think a, a good a good deal on a half of beef, I think it's somewhere around what, nine hundred bucks or something. I think it's a good deal. Good price on half a cow or half a half a steer or whatever. I want to say, and so I'd say it, uh, it would be 1800 bucks, probably. And then I don't know what sheep are worth. I wouldn't give you anything for them, but they valued them then. Six of those a day. And then fowls also. So we could say probably in today's economy, Nehemiah was spending about $5,000 per day of his own money on food to feed all the people that were working for the people. In other words, not only was he not chargeable to the people, but everybody that served under Nehemiah, in other words, everybody in the government, was supported by Nehemiah. And every ten days they had all different kinds of juice. Wine does mean fruit of the vine. And even in that context, it's not, you know, they weren't all getting drunk every ten days on fine wine, but it was a big deal to be able to, you know, have all the different types of of uh, wine in the day. I don't know what the value of it was in the day, but the value of it was one ox, six sheep, and a bunch of fowl every single day. A bunch of birds that he fed the people that worked for him at his table. If you think about it, he would have been responsible for the people that prepared it. Can you imagine what kind of a staff it would take to cook an entire ox and six entire sheep and a whole bunch of birds? Every day, can you imagine the staff? I mean, this is pretty. I don't know. I mean, I don't just read through Nehemiah chapter five and go, uh, 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 nothing there. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? And what is the point of it all? Well, the Holy Spirit felt led to have Nehemiah recorded in the Scripture, didn't he? The the point of it was that Nehemiah served God at great cost. He served God and great personal cost. Now, we, when we began looking at this book of Nehemiah, one of the things that we said was Nehemiah was pretty well fixed. If he's the cupbearer to the King Artaxerxes, he's literally his number two guy in the world. In the world. And he's pretty well fixed. Matter of fact, he's got such an important position that he very easily could have begged off or bowed out of fulfilling his responsibility. He could have said, those people living in Jerusalem need to do something. And he could have even ran an ad on television and, you know, match dollar for dollar donations or something generous like that. What did Nehemiah do? He went to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem. He took the responsibility and he built the walls. Literally, one of the first things we saw about this guy, Nehemiah, who led the nation into revival was that if he'd been the only one that's had the burden and saw the need, he would have tried to build the walls himself. I'll tell you something. He not only was willing to build the walls himself, he was willing to he was willing to go to war at his own charge or to pay for the building at his own expense. He didn't take a tribute from a people who actually could take tribute. And then the Bible also indicates Nehemiah said something else he didn't do was that he did not buy land. What happens? when a place gets developed. If you're into real estate and you realize that a neighborhood in a community is about to get developed, what do you want to do? Buy prime property, right? I mean, how many of y'all would like to have property on Las Olas, you know, uh, you know, 50 years ago? <laughs> or 100 years ago? I mean, there are a lot of spots, if you had a little foresight, like some people did, and you just you know, purchased a few hundred acres, 
you'd be in the billions right now. And Nehemiah said, when I went to Jerusalem to develop it, I didn't buy any land. That's significant, isn't it? Would he have been in his right to buy land? Would he have been in his right to be supported by the people the same way the other governors had been? I'm talking humanly speaking. The answer to both of those is yes. He would have been in his right to purchase land. He would have been in his right to be supported. But he did not, and the reason for it was because he was concerned not with enriching himself. He was just concerned about the testimony of God. Churches are broken when preachers think they own them. Sometimes you see a guy and he gets to be well known and his ministry gets to be successful. And he starts to take things on himself or take things for himself. And when people call him into question, he asks the question, don't I have the right? Didn't I give everything? Didn't I sacrifice? Didn't I work? And the answer sometimes to the question would be that you're not supposed to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. But there's just something about somebody who has the right and doesn't take it. We'll just go to a New Testament example for that, and then we'll finish up tonight, shall we? Uh, let's go, if you will permit, if you will please, to... Let, um, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians and um, chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is Paul speaking of a right that he had that he didn't take. In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're not there, I'll begin reading. You can catch up. It'll be somewhere after verse 1 if you haven't gotten there yet. Am I not an apostle? And am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power, or do we not have the right... To eat and drink, have we not power to lead about a sister or wife as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man? Or saith not the, the law of the same also? For it is written the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of the oxen, or saith it all together for our sakes? So is God, did God write that in the Scripture for the ox, or did He write in the Scripture for the servant of God? And he says in verse 10, For our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? And he says, if others be partakers of this power over, or power over you, are, we not, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer or allow all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And here we find a Nehemiah testimony in the New Testament. Paul is an apostle, and his point is, where did you come from, church at Corinth? And what was the origin of the church in Corinth? You, you ever read Acts? Where did the church in Corinth get started? Paul was living in the house next door to the synagogue of Crispus. Remember that? And those guys got saved. And that's where the church got started in Corinth, and that's where Paul served for more than a year and had rest. Who founded the church at Corinth? Paul did. Paul said, even if you could argue that I'm not legitimately an apostle, even if you would say that I have not seen the resurrected Christ and I haven't met the qualifications for an apostle, you can't argue that you're not the fruit of my ministry. You wouldn't be Christians. You would, there wouldn't be a church in Corinth that you're part of without me. And then he goes on to say, he said, I have the right to expect of you to be supported by you. But he said, nevertheless, we've not used this power to suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, he's been disrespected by the very people whom he has served. And his, his argument with them is, that not only should you give me due honor as an apostle, but you should give me due honor by supporting me as an apostle. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
he continues this theme because it seems as though it's a hang-up for them. It seems as though they're questioning Paul's motives. They're saying, why does Paul think he has the right to act like an apostle and tell us what to do? And Paul, <laughs> the reason Paul thought that was why. Paul called to be an apostle. Paul, an apostle of the... Uh, finish it. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who called Paul to be an apostle? Man, sometimes I think maybe y'all don't know anything or maybe I'm really confusing. I can't really figure it out. Okay, so Paul was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who called Paul to be an apostle? Jesus did. Okay, so Paul was a legitimate apostle, right? As a legitimate apostle, did he have not the right to be taken care of the way Peter did? Or the other apostles? The answer is yes. And Paul said, even if, even if you were to question my apostleship, as you've done, he said... The fact that you exist is a proof of my apostleship. You are a witness of my apostleship. You wouldn't exist if I hadn't served the Lord. Pretty good evidence. They're going to say he's not legitimate. What are they as his offspring in the Lord? Right? You're not an apostle. Well, then what are you? If you've received the gospel I preached to you. What are you? Okay. Verse 1 of chapter 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. By the way, God's jealous, isn't He, in His jealousy? Jealousy, of course, in its appropriate context, is, a, is, is a, a careful guarding of rightful affection that belongs to you. So when God is jealous, He's not envious. He's not wanting something that doesn't belong to Him. We, we mix up the word sometimes. When God's jealous, it means that He is jealous over affections going to someone whom they're not, they don't belong. For instance, my wife and I have a jealous kind of a love with each other. Now doesn't mean we're always acting out. We probably never act out uh, as far as that goes. But my wife has the right to expect behavior from me that, that is only toward her. And I have the right to expect from my wife behavior that's only toward me because of our particular relationship. You say, Pastor, why do you have a problem with your wife kissing other people? Well, because she's married to me. That's why. Pastor, why does your wife not want you to show affection to other women? Well, because I'm married to her. That's why. And it's appropriate for me to be affectionate to my wife, and it's appropriate for my wife to be affectionate to me, and we're jealous of that affection because it belongs to the two of us as one of the benefits of marriage. And if you're not married to us, and you can't be because we're the only ones married to us, then you don't have the right. Jealous. That's the way God's saying about jealousy. In other words, God's God a carving, a stick that's carved into an image. Is that God? No. You know, God doesn't just require, we've said this several times, but God doesn't just require primacy. He doesn't just want to be number one. He's the only God. There's no God like God. There's no comparison with God. God doesn't just say, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, saying, you know what, I have to be number one. God is saying there is no other God. No other God exists. He's the only God. He's the only creator. He's the only one. And as such, he has the right to be jealous. And Paul is saying, I have rights as an apostle. He said in verse 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste version of Christ. Paul said, I've got a real problem with you receiving a gospel that's another gospel. That's what it's about. False belief, false doctrine, following people that aren't apostles. And Paul said, it isn't because I need you to follow me. He said, it's because I'm supposed to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You're supposed to be pure. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For he that cometh, if he that cometh preaches another Jesus which we have, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God? Freely, Notice verse 8 and 9. This is what we're getting to. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, as chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and all things I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Paul was very, very careful because of the place that he ministered, because of the willingness of the people. 
figure out who keeps tampering with the air conditioners it's hot up here. Uh, because of his uh, his willingness, what's that? Mike. <laughs> Mike, he's not here. Temperature tamper. <laughs> Temperature tyrant. Um, <clears throat> Paul was explaining to the church that he was very, very careful not to be a burden to them because of the attitude that they had toward him. In other words, they were watching him for some kind of scruple. They were actually accusing him of things that weren't true. Paul, you know, you just... You just want to be the boss at Corinth. You just want to, you know, have your way because you're trying to make a fortune out of it. Paul's saying, I've never taken a penny from anything from you guys. And the only thing I'm concerned about is that I can present you as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. In other words, you need to be pure doctrinally. And so I've been very, very meticulous, very, very careful not to take anything from you because, because it would detract from the message of the gospel. Now, did Paul illustrate in chapter 9 that he had the right to receive or to be chargeable or to have wages from the church? Did he have that right like the other apostles did? The answer is yes. But did he receive the right? The answer is no. Did Nehemiah have the right to be supported? But did he? Was he? No. Did he have the right to buy land? I mean, who was it responsible? Who was responsible for developing Jerusalem and making it a bustling, successful province, if you will? Nehemiah was. So if, if anybody should have profited from it, shouldn't Nehemiah have? No, he should not have because it would have contradicted his message. Christian, I just want to say to you this evening by way of application that we were going somewhere. You know, some things as a believer, it may be in your right to do, but it will contradict your message. Sometimes as a believer, you may be in your right to do something, but if you're really concerned with the testimony of God, you will not be concerned with how you profit or what is your right. Rather, instead, you'll be concerned with the message and the testimony of the one whom you represent. What was the description Nehemiah gave of Jerusalem when the walls were torn down? He said, we are a reproach. We're a reproach. Literally, we are harming the testimony of God. And you know, Christian, it may be that you are in your right to do some things, it may be that you're in your right to have some things, but it might be as well that those that would speak would reproach the name of Christ because of it. And in those cases, you know what you and I ought to do in order to see revival? Surrender our rights. I wonder how badly we want to have a breath from heaven. I wonder how badly we desire to just really see God move. Not just in us, but in our church. And how badly we want to see God move in our lifetimes. I just want to tell you something. I'm getting old enough. I'm afraid I'll never see God greatly move if we don't see something soon. I'm just, I don't have a lot of time left. I don't know how, much, how many years, how many days God's going to give me. I don't know what is left, but I want to see God do something in my lifetime. And if that's true, and it is for me, and if that's true for our church as well, then we ought to be willing to surrender some things that are our rights, shouldn't we? You know, it might be that you go to the grave and you never, uh, you never really have much. If you got to see God work, would that be worth it? Satan's all the time trying to tell us what is our right, isn't he? You know, everything that's ever been done in this ministry has really been done by volunteers, by people that just gave. And a matter of fact, the giving has always been pretty much sacrificial. It's always been people that didn't have much giving more than they had, just like the kind of the churches in Macedonia always did. Paul said about them, he said, to their power they were willing and beyond their power they were willing praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. So that's the way they gave. You know, I think in order to see revival, we've got to have that kind of a mindset. The kind of mindset that says, you know something? I may have the right. I may have invested. And no one could argue I deserve a return for my investment. But the reality of it is, is that the testimony of Christ and the work of God is actually more valued that, than that to me. You may be a Nehemiah. You know, I don't know how it all ended up, but if I had to guess, Nehemiah probably ended up pretty well broke. Think about 12 years. An oxen, six sheep, and uh, 
a bunch of fowls, and every 10 days, all the special juice. For all the servants, for everybody, and not getting paid wages during that time. Nehemiah came to Jerusalem with a fat bank account, and I'll bet you by the time he was done being governor, he was busted. Was it worth it? He said, remember me, O Lord. God, you remember this. You think God remembered? <laughs> the account of it's in the Scripture, isn't it? And God's Word's eternal. My friend, serve the Lord Jesus. And serve for reward that God can give. You'll be amazed at what God will do. Nehemiah never ceases to amaze me with the humility and the spirit that he had. And man, did God ever do a work in his lifetime. And those around him, I believe, receive collateral blessing like Zerubbabel. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. I ask you to increase the truth of it in our hearts. And Lord, if we're faced, if we are faced with surrendering our right for the testimony, may we do so for the sake of seeing your hand and for the sake of your testimony being above reproach. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take some prayer requests tonight, shall we?